want to thank all of you for uh, coming today. This is an exceptional turnout. It's absolutely wonderful to see everyone turn out for our, what we expect to be an annual stroke education today. We hope that you will learn a lot from this. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Mary Rogers. Mary is a professionally trained in manicures, pedicures, reflexology, and healing with sound and Reiki. She utilizes these modalities as a medium of helping others not only to look good, but to feel good. Mary experienced severe childhood abuse and then a near-fatal aneurysm at the age of 39. She recovered from the trauma and rehabilitation and chose to assist others in their own personal process to rise above their turmoil. Mary supports the belief that each person's body has the innate ability to heal and be well. With patience, persistence, and guidance, Mary holds up the mirror for each person to take responsibility for creating harmony in his or her life. Please welcome Mary Rogers. Good morning. I'm going to pour water because I get dried mouth, so I'll be with you in a second. Well, I'm really excited to be here because this is going to be the first time that I tell my story in public for the first time. So um, I'm a little nervous and I have to follow a little script here. And where's the rest of my stuff, Thor? I don't see it. Yeah. Oh, under here. That's helpful. No? So how y'all doing? Huh. Okay, um, I think one of the points that I really want to drive home today, since we're all in a caregiving profession, is um, my experience with my stroke was that I didn't have a voice, and people tend to not really pay attention to you when you don't have a voice. So even if they're brain dead, or the machine says they're brain dead, you need to be there and you need to touch and you need to care because I was in and out of a coma for about four months so it's it's like um, probably the most important piece and I was really there I could hear things every once in a while I could see things um, but for the most part there was a lot of darkness um, I would like to thank Roxanne Heacock um, who I met at Kerpalo doing reflexology. We are, we are certified reflexologists. And I'd like to thank Laura. You are so cute <laughs> and so helpful, really. Um, and my, my dear friend Barb, who is in the back filming this, because um, my hope is, is that I'm going to be able to put this on my uh, website and you can click on it and hear me again and again and again. <laughs> And um, before I tell you about the aneurysm, I want to tell you a little bit more about my life. I was born in Colorado Springs. Um, I'm the youngest of seven. My mom was a Montessori teacher, and my father was a chief investigator of child abuse in Colorado Springs for 30 years. From the outside, our family looked really nice and appropriate and, like, no dysfunction going on. But behind closed doors, there was a whole other thing going on. And my father was severely abusive um, to my brothers and my sisters and sexually abusive with all my sisters and myself. So um, my, parents, <clears throat> my parents divorced when I was, I think it was, I was nine. But he was in the house back and forth. Um, throughout until the divorce was final and then every other weekend I had visitation and that wasn't such a good thing it was not not good um, I married at a very young age um, I had a, a baby when I was 21 and completely and totally unprepared for what that meant and actually while I was pregnant it was in the eighth month of my pregnancy I called my oldest sister because I was having a whole lot of like really intense um, emotions, anger, sadness, um, depression, uh, and, I, and I said, Sharon, what, 
what's going on? Is it just the pregnancy? And she said, well, I'm in a group therapy situation. Why don't you come and join us and talk about, you know, your feelings? And I thought, oh, okay. So I went and it was very clear that I had some serious issues. So um, I sought out my own counseling. And I can't tell you how many people uh, or therapists that I fired because there was sexual abuse by my mother that I never had repressed. And these therapists kept telling me that, oh, well, you were sexually abused by your father. And I said, well, you're fired because that wasn't my memory of things. And my last therapist, who um, I'm grateful for now, but then not so much, um, I said to him, I said, here's the deal. If you're going to tell me that my father sexually abused me, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to leave now. And he said, well, how could I do that? Why would I do that? I don't even know you. I said, okay, well, that's a good answer. And um, several months into the, um, the therapy, um, he invited me to close my eyes and imagine myself at the age, which I was 23, and he says, imagine telling your father what it was like for you when the next door neighbor abused you and he sexually abused me. I closed my eyes and I went, you son of a bitch. And he said, what? I said, I don't know what, I don't know how, I don't know where, but my father did the same thing to me as the next door neighbor, only worse. I don't know what it is but you have now opened the can of worms. And it was horrifying. Day after day after day, give birth to a baby, don't know what's going on or how to do it. And um, so there was a series of, of psych ward entrances. There was all kinds of things going on that I just was completely unavailable to my newborn baby and completely shut down from my ex-husband. And um, he wasn't real supportive of like my therapy or what was going on. He, he's a French Canadian, not that that's bad, but he was not a very talkative nor emotionally available man. So um, that was really, really hard to, to continue in that marriage the way that it was going. Um, so I asked my therapist, I said, you know, seriously, I gotta call my father on all this stuff. I, I gotta, I, I gotta do something with this. I can't let him think that it's all okay because it's not. So, well, you, you do have the option to give him a call. And since there was awful abuse with my mother as well, I called her, and I said, my therapist says it might be a good idea to invite you in on the therapy session, and maybe you can help me get through this. And my mother said, absolutely not. So that was a no, and then I called my father, same thing. So I went back to my therapist and I said, they're not gonna do anything, and he says, you do have one more option. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, you could take your father to court. And since my father is a lawman, I went, oh, okay. And um, I pursued an attorney in Vermont who pursued an attorney in Colorado there was a lot of money that I spent getting things lined up. And um, before I went to Colorado Springs to be with my sister, my sister and I were going to do the lawsuit together. The other two sisters were just going to, you know, um, do a deposition. Excuse me. And my ex-husband says to me, you either drop this lawsuit or I'm taking our daughter and I'm leaving. And I thought, um, I can't do that, no. So I called my sister and I said, I, I don't know what to say to you, but um, I, can't, I can't have this, I can't have dad like totally ruin what I got going on here with a baby and a husband. I'm divorced. I think that says a lot. And so she says, oh God, you can't do that, Mary. So I hope I have enough evidence. And so she flew out to Colorado with my other sister um, and, um, there was a lawsuit, and my father went to Mexico. I don't know, big statement there. Um, the judge awarded $2.3 million. 
tons of media, tons of press, tons of things happened. And a Hollywood movie was made. Um, it was called The Ultimate Betrayal, Ali Sheedy. I was a big, like, um, back in the day, you know, St. Elmo's Fire. I just loved her. And I just said that, and, and the producer got her to play my part. Unfortunately, when I went out there to Toronto where it was being filmed, um, I was in, I was just, I was drinking a lot. I was com really mostly disassociated from myself most of my life. So it, I drank through dinner. And apparently Ali Sheedy said to my sister, although I, she didn't say this till years and years later, she says, I don't know what's going on with your sister, but you need to um, approach her and let her know that she's got some trouble happening. And so years and years uh, prior to, ad well, adolescence on, in and out of like doing drugs and alcohol and, you know, it just, it just didn't stop. But I always wanted to get better. I always had this, this um, fight inside of me that, um, I knew that at some point it's got to give. Either I'll kill myself or somehow I'll make this a life.